Hello everybody, welcome to Mr. Stanley's Chess Academy. This is the Intermediate Course Lesson 4. Um, and what we're going to do in today's lesson is we are going to look at uh, an opening for black. So we've looked at a couple of openings for white, the Italian and the Spanish openings. We're going to look at an opening for black today. Um, we're going to think about um, how we need to um, think in the middle game to solve problems that we're going to face. Uh, and so thinking about forks, skewers and pins um, again. And then we're going to look, we're just going to review and recap um, the key end game checkmates that we need to be able to do before we move on. So the lawnmower mate, mate with king and queen and mate with king and rook. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, looking at the opening uh, game again. So today we're going to focus on uh, the black pieces. So um, if we if we start the game um, as black, then um, what would we do if white decided to do uh, their typical e4 opening? So uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to teach you a defence that's called the two knights defence, and you'll very quickly work out why it's called the two knights defence. So here we have um, white plays pawn to e4, which is what most white players will open with um, at the intermediate level um, and, and even at the expert level. Very, very most common opening because it's so powerful, as we've seen. So um, the, the best response by black, if your black pieces to this, is to move your pawn to e5. Now, there's several reasons because of why you do this. First of all, it blocks um, white's uh, pawn trampsing up the board. Basically, pawns would always want to keep going all the way up the board. The further up the board, the more of a nuisance they are to your opponent. So white will take any opportunity to move his pawns up the board if you let them. So this move here stops that happening. It stops the white pawn moving up the board. It also takes control of one of the central squares that we've talked about being so important. And it also puts pressure on another one of the central squares, which is so important, and pressure on one of the outer central squares, which are not as important as the central squares, but still quite important. So we can see why this is a very good uh, opening move for black. So let's imagine that the, uh, the white is going to be playing the uh, Italian game, the Gioco Piano, or the Spanish game, the Oil Pez. Um, and so the move that white might do is to move the knight to uh, c3. Now, if you look at this from a black perspective, as we've talked from a white perspective, if you look at a black perspective, you're going to be worried because white is threatening to take your pawn on e5 next go. And you don't want to lose any material. You don't want to lose any pieces if you can help it, unless it's a you know it's pawn for pawn or knight for knight. So, so you want to stop this happening. So you've got several options to stop this happening. One thing is to maybe move this pawn out because you've you've then, if the knight takes the pawn, you can take the knight, and that means that you have captured the knight, which is worth three points and um, he's captured only your pawn which is worth one point so you're already your two points up you've got two strategic points up so this is quite a nice one but we're looking at the two knights opening so the picture you want to move is a knight so we are going to move this knight here on b8 and we're going to move it to c6 so you can see here that the knight here is now protecting this pawn Okay, so uh, white aren't going to take the pawn on e5 because if they do, then your knight on c6 will take them back. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. Now, um, at this stage, at this stage, white might do, might be doing, say, the Italian game. Um, they put their bishop on c4. Now, the second move in the two knights defense. I wonder if you can guess what it is. Well, we've moved one knight. So the second move for the two knights defense is to move your second knight. And so if we move the knight here to f6. And so what this move does 
is it puts pressure on the center. So as you can see, this pawn here on e4 is now ripe for the taking. It's undefended by white. So you're giving white a problem. Um, and so that means that their next move, they might think about having to defend that pawn. I'm just going to show you something which might, white might do in this situation. They might move their knight here to g5. Now the idea behind this is that next move they're going to take the pawn here on f7 and then you'll be in a fork, the queen and the rook will be in a fork. Now this is called the fried liver attack and we'll look at this more closely in future lessons. But if white do, does do this, then the move that you need to do is black is with this pawn here, you move it to d5. Okay, so this stops the bishop being able to support the knight. And so the king will be able to take the knight. And if there's an exchange, well, if you take the rook, uh, if you take the pawn, your pawn, then um, black can come and take with the knight, and then the bishop, and you'll see that black um, is already um, three points up on that exchange. So, um, so white aren't going to do that. Okay, and that in a nutshell is the two knights opening. Let's go through it again. White e4, then your response is e5. Uh, if white do d g3, then the first knight you move is, it's your, it's your queen's knight you move first. There we are, because we are protecting this pawn here. Black might do this, and then you do that, and there we go. And that is the, that is the uh, two knight opening. It's a very strong opening. You are putting lots of pressure from your knights onto the central squares. Um, you've got pressure from the pawn onto the central squares, and then you can, you know, very easy next move, get the bishop out, castle your king away to safety, and you're in a strong position. One more time. Okay, and then if I does that, then you can do this and then if white does this then you can do this and there we are the two knights opening so if you play black pieces um, and you think how should i start the game you know what should i do the two knight defense is a is a pretty safe and surefire way to start a game of chess for uh black pieces um and so you know Remember it, learn it, get a chessboard out, practice it a bit, find someone to play against, see how it works uh, in a real game and get a feeling for what possibilities it leads to. Okay, I now want to talk about the middle game. Now we've, we've, we've talked a, a bit about middle game about how we need to think during the middle game because this is when we use our chess thinking and we need to structure our thoughts to make sure we're not making any mistakes. Um, and we've had a look at some of the things, some of the motifs we need to look out for, such as um, forks and pins and skewers. And so what I want to do now is I want to look at three um, exercises, three studies to get us thinking in a, in a chess way. So um, I've talked before about how it's really important to do chess puzzles. And the idea is, is, that, is that you're getting your brain to think fluently about chess, to, to see the patterns in chess, to, to begin to feel chess. And, and you can't really do that just by watching videos like this or by um, reading chess books, as some of you do, I'm sure. Um, you need to play chess, you need to start thinking about chess problems, so your, your mind becomes more and more and more fluent in chess. Just like as if you're learning a foreign language, the more you speak a foreign language, the better you'll get at it. So we're gonna, we're gonna try and think, think like chess players now by looking at three separate puzzles. Um, so here's the first, here's the first puzzle. Now, as I've talked before, these are, are situations that have come up in games between grandmasters usually, or sometimes people just set these puzzles up themselves. 
and sometimes in these puzzles you need to try and get checkmates but sometimes it's just how you can get a strategic advantage or capture some material uh, or get one up on your opponent so that you, you might win in the future and so you're basically pretending that this is your game of chess that it's your move and what is the best move that you could do so um, in this position um, let's say it's white move okay it's white to move and we need to try and see what the best move is in this position now when you're when you're faced with this you, you need to just first of all just look at the board so just to start to won't talk for sort of 15 seconds or so, so just just look at the board Okay, so first of all, you need to think about uh, what what is what is going on. What is the story here? So first of all, who's winning and who's losing? So let's let's just have a look at the points first of all. So we've got um, black has got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six pawns. So that's six points. They've got oh no, they've got another pawn, seven points. They've got a knight, that's another three points, so that's 10 points. And a queen, which is nice, they've got 19 points. Um, white's got one, two, three, four, five, six pawns. And then they've got the um, knight as well, so that's uh, nine points in total. And the queen. Um, so that's 18 points. Just looking, I can't count, can I today? Black's got six pawns. So black's got 18 points as well. So, so, so there's, there's, they're, they're equal in terms of material in how much, you know, how much firepower they've got. Um, the position looks pretty, um, looks pretty even as well, um, because because uh, look, all the pawns are kind of matched up. No pawn can easily get get down and, 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 and convert into a queen. So, you know, that there seems to be strategically even. If I'm white, I'm a little bit worried about something. I wonder if you can see what my concern is as white. No, I'm worried, oh, two I'm worried about. I'm worried about this queen coming down here to C1 and then getting me in check there. That'd be a little bit, a little bit awkward. I'd probably have to move this knight to stop it and then the queen could take this pawn. So, you know, there's there's that going on. But it's, it's my move as white. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this board and I'm studying, I'm thinking, what is my best move? What is my best move in this situation? Now, I'm showing you this because we looked at forks last time. And this is a, this is a puzzle to do with forks. So it's white to move. And it's something to do with a fork. So look very closely. And what we need to do, first of all, is we need to think about, we need to think about um, what, are, what are possible moves that we can do. What some chess players call candidate moves. So you said different candidates in an election for who's going to be president or prime minister. These are for the moves, which candidates have we got, which we might be able to do It's a good move. So let's just go over them. So one, um, let's have a think. So, so one, um, one candidate move may be to try and stop this move that I'm worried about. So I'm worried about the queen coming down here. So maybe one candidate move I could do would be to move my knight here and then that would cover this square here so the queen couldn't come and get check. Mm. I quite like the look of that move. However, I don't really gain anything from it and the queen could still come down to here where she could still threaten my knight here and then maybe take this pawn next go. So mm, maybe, maybe that is a candidate move, but maybe not. Let's, let's have a look at some others. Maybe, maybe I could move this pawn up here. 
maybe the next move I could move this pawn up here and maybe attack the queen. Mm, but that doesn't that doesn't get me very far. I could move this pawn forward either there or there. So I could it was like creating an escape route for my king here. Yeah, that could be a. But that doesn't really bring me very much. And, and these puzzles, they usually like show a move that really changes the course of the game. And neither of those moves do that. Must be a better move here somewhere. Maybe it's something to do my queen. Um, and so, and so, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to I'm trying to model for you the thinking process of what chess players go through. So we don't just see just go with the first move we see. We we kind of explore all the possibilities before we make a move. When you see chess players just sitting in silence out on the board, this is what's going on in their heads. They're thinking, shall I move this or shall I move this? So I think it's something to do with the queen. So, so the queen, say if we move it here to d4, then it's protected by the pawn. And then maybe, maybe if the queen takes it, then I'll take the queen with my pawn. And this pawn isn't blocked by this pawn anymore. It might be able to go and become a queen. Oh, that's quite that's quite a nice move. But the, the queen doesn't necessarily have to take it. Hmm. I wonder, I wonder what would happen if I took if I took the knight here, is that lunacy? Is that quite often the answers to these puzzles is a what we call a sacrificial move like this. So, if my queen was here and I took the knight, it would be taken by the king here. So this means the king would sit on f6. Does that bring me any advantage if the king sits on f6? Hmm. If you're wondering, this is a uh, a very nice lemon ginger manuka honey tea. I'm not drinking today. Hmm. So if the king's sitting there, oh, can you see what I've just seen? If I move the knight here and the king's here, oh, there's a fork. The king will be on check. And then I'll be able to take the queen. Wow. So that means that if we do that combination that that's forced, black's really got no other option, then I will be a knight up. <gasps> well, maybe that's the answer. Let me just check that. And we've got to check and double check it. So I take this. King takes that, we'll have to be in check. Well, it won't have to, but it'd be quite foolish if he doesn't. And then I move here, check, then I'll have to take the queen. Oh, the pawn will take the knight, but I will still be, oh, but then my, oh, but my pawn will still be able to move forward. I, I think that is, the solution. And so can you see by just knowing about forks, what a fork is, that actually even though there's no fork in this move, in the first move, if I know about forks, I'm thinking about forks, I can see how doing a move can lead to a fork, which can lead to a good position. So any of the other moves that I considered are, are perfectly respectable moves, and um, moves which wouldn't lead to any defeating chess, but looking at all the different options and ruling them out one by one will lead you to a move that is better than others. And if, if it doesn't need to a move that's better than others, it doesn't matter, then then just choose one of the other moves. One move that you like the pattern of best, that you think is best. You might want to be an aggressive player, you might play a defensive player. So use these to choose which of the moves that you want to do. But the important thing is, is to look at all the different options that you have and rule them out one by one and, and take your time. That's what chess is about. It's about thinking seriously for a long period of time.
So let's just play this out. So the queen takes the knight, king takes the queen, and then the knight takes, pawn there, check. Uh, king needs to move out of the way, and then the knight takes that, and then pawn takes the knight. And can you see that after that exchange, black now has only five points, whereas white has got six points, and these two pawns are split as well, which is a quite a bad thing. Okay, so that's the solution to that puzzle. Let's, can you see how you've got to think long and hard about these things? And, and, and in the middle of the game of chess, this is where you need to do the, the real thinking. Let's, let's have a, um, I was going to say let's have a look at this one, but it's the same as the, as the one we just looked at. Let's have a look at, ah, Oh, I was going to I was going to work through three puzzles with you, but it appears that my computer's only letting me do one with you. We probably thought long and hard enough about that one puzzle to actually um, to actually frazzle our chess brains as it is. So we'll have a look at a couple more puzzles next time. So what we'll do now is we're going to go on to look at the um, at the end game. So we have seen uh, we have looked at several we. Oh, what's going on? We have looked at several um, end game patterns. Let's just kill the board. And I just wanted to, before we went on to the, the next stage of understanding about uh, the chess end game, to actually make sure we understand these, um, these uh, end game checkmates. Okay, so very quickly, we can have a look at what's known as the lawnmower mate, where you have, uh, where you have two rooks, and a king against a king. Um, so just have a look at this very quickly. Hopefully you can remember what is the best move to do here. So it's about laser beams, isn't it? So you move the rook here to h5, and this is creating a fence. So you are trapping uh, the king um, here. So the king cannot move on to the fifth uh the fifth rank there so the king might, might go there and then just like a uh, lawnmower spin around like this you move the uh, rook up here and then you've got the lasers across there king can't move uh onto the fifth rank so it has to move to the seventh rank this uh, rook comes down king has to move here because of this and then you've got the checkmate there okay so that's king with uh, checkmate with two rooks. Let's just have a look at another example of that because the more examples we have, the better. So we have, you know, so the best move here isn't to get checked straight away. We set the fence, set the fence, and then check, check, check. Remember we've got, oh, it's a bit of a wonky one, isn't it? Uh, remember we've got these laser beams coming down, check, and then checkmate. If, uh, if you're in a situation where the player starts giving your rooks a bit of grief, so if the, the king starts coming up here, check. <gasps> so here we have a situation where if you carried on and did check, the king would then take this rook. So look out for that. If that happens, don't panic. Just take a move to move the rook right down the other side of the board, and the king might be a little sorry. Oh, the king might be a little bit cheeky, and all the pieces disappear as you try to explain it. Um, and the king might, in this situation, then go up to here. So if you want to go check, you can't because take it again. Don't worry. Just move your rook right down the other side of the board. And then it... And then you can just go check. Check. Oh, he's done it again. Because look, if you move here, he'll take you, so you can't do that. Don't worry, 
just move your foot up to the other side of the board. You might do. Might then uh, do this move here to attack this again. But again, don't worry. Just move it right up to the side of the board. Maybe not that far to there. The king then has to move there. And then we have checkmate. OK, so that is how you get checkmate with two rooks. I hope you remember it. If you uh, are still unsure about it, again, practice, 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 practice. Um, the other checkmate that you need to be really uh, fluent in is the checkmate with a queen and a king. Um, and just to recap this, remember boxes, boxes, boxes with this. So we think, where's the smallest box that we can set first of all? So uh, maybe if we move the queen, let's, let's be creative. Let's move it to this square here. So we're creating quite a nice, a nice big box here. So the king can't go on any of those squares. So the king might go here. Let's close the box. Uh, king might mm, pop here. Let's close the box. Remember the important thing is you're not getting checked all the time. You're just clo slowly closing the box. Uh, king might go here this time. Um, not much opportunity to do this. We'll bring up the king up in support. Remember, we need the king's support to do this. Maybe move it there. Oh, look, we can close the box because we've got the king's support now. Okay. Check. There we go. Uh, maybe go there. And we can bring the king in support again. Uh, check. Oh, he's not, he's not, doesn't move like a knight. So there we go. And so the king might go here. Wants to keep out the middle. Bring the, this king up in support. King up in support. Need to check, make sure I'm not getting stalemate. I think the king can still still move to this square here. So he moves to this square here. Um, and then slowly. Closing the box again. Okay, so the king can now only move between these two squares. I need to be careful now not to get um, stalemate. So I'll just bring, because if in this situation the king goes here and then I bring my king up here. The king can't go anywhere without being taken, so that would be stalemate. So we don't want that to happen. So uh, we just need to get this king to back off a second. And then move the queen in here. Check. Oh, it might still be stalemate if I don't move the queen because the king can't go to any of these squares. But the king can go there and I can just bring the king up in support. And then it's checkmate. Okay, so boxes, 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 slowly shrinking box and bring the king up to support, but look out for the stalemate and make sure you've always got uh, a release square that the king can go to before you deal the final blow. And finally today, the um, other checkmate, which is probably the trickiest of them, is where you have um, a king and a rook playing against just the king. But remember, it's the same principle as if you're playing the queen. It just takes a bit longer. So um, we're looking at the uh, smallest box first of all. So the smallest box will be moving the rook here. So we've got quite a large box here. But the king can never move out that box unless he attacks the rook itself. But you can support that with the king. So now if the king moves, then you close the box. King moves again, may bring your king up in support. Then we are closing the box just a little bit at the time. Take your time, We're always being a bit awkward. That's okay, look, we can close the box again, just slowly, take your time. Now, in this situation, you might be tempted to go here to close the box, but then he'll pop out the box here. So we won't do that. Um, 
so we'll just we'll just take our time again and then we'll close the box a little bit more there we go maybe the king might go there oh look we can close the box again And then we've got this situation, so we've got the kings facing each other. So white now controls these three squares. So the rook can come here. And then that's checkmate. Okay, so it's very similar to the queen, um, king, checkmate, but this is with a rook and a king. Um, and you slowly close the box. And you take a little bit of time towards the end to get position, piece in the right position, but you're looking for a meeting pattern that is similar to this. I thought I'd just take time today to go over those three, the lawnmower mate, queen and king mate, rook and king mate, just to make sure you've got them firm in your head because we're going to go on next time to look at a pawn and king mate and things get a little bit more complicated uh, for that. So, so it's, it's really good if you can actually um, master these ones first. And again, if you're someone at home you can play with um, to set a board up or just play with yourself um, to um, go through these routines to see if you can um, get checkmate every time with two king, two rooks, queen and a king, and a rook and a king. Okay, and you really need those skills to advance in chess. Great, well thank you for your hard work today and all your hard chess thinking. Um, so next time we'll look at another defence for black, we shall look at some more chess puzzles and we'll look at how to get checkmate with just a pawn and a king. Uh, so I'll see you then.